Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome to the course Gender and Literature. My, I'm a course instructor, Abhishek Pari. I teach English at the Indian School of Technology, Guwahati. So today what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to this course. I'm going to talk about what is the content of this course, what are the main topics that we'll cover as we proceed with this course. And more importantly, I'm going to give you a flavor of the course. So what is it that you expect from this course? Uh, so there are, broadly speaking, two components of this course. One is the theoretical component where we look at certain theories of gender uh, and how those theories play out in literary texts and social situations. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about, uh, as we proceed with the course, I'm going to talk about the, the, the practical component of this course. How is this course relevant in our daily discourses of life, uh, in the things we see around us, in the things we feel around us, etc. So one of the uh, complexities of this course, which I believe is also one of the beauties of this course, is its immediate relevance to our social situations. So gender, I mean it's a very loaded term as you all know. Uh, we sometimes enjoy gender, we sometimes suffer gender, uh, but in either case we negotiate with gender. So gender is something we negotiate with uh, through our body, through our language, through our dress, uh, through our embodiment generally speaking. Now in this particular course, literature and gender, uh, we will look at certain literary texts, we will choose certain literary texts as we proceed where we will talk about how certain gender constructions uh, play out in those texts against certain cultural conditions. Now, obviously as we all know that every literary text is produced out of certain cultural conditions. So no work of literature can exist in a vacuum, uh, it can't just happen out of nowhere. So the reason why Shakespeare wrote certain kind of plays was because it, it, it's a related to the cultural conditions of his times. And of course, there's a very rich uh, gender and literature study which we'll do in Shakespeare. But before we begin anything, before we sort of move into a dive into the theoretical complexities and the practical possibilities of this course, I would like you to imagine a situation, a hypothetical situation. I mean, I'm saying it's hypothetical, but actually it's a real, real situation, something which can happen all the time. It does happen. It happens to you, it happens to your friends, etc. Imagine a man and a woman walking into a restaurant one of those uh, nice restaurants where you can order different kinds of food, multi cuisine food, uh, you know, where the person who waits on you will come over in the, in the, in the end and give you a feedback form, etc. that kind of a place. Imagine a man and a woman walking into that restaurant or a boy and a girl walking into that restaurant and ordering different kinds of beverages, right? Uh, imagine, uh, for the sake of familiarity, imagine uh, the boy and a girl and a man and a woman ordering thumbs up and fruity or thumbs up and maza, a sweet mango drink and a hot fizzy drink, right? And you don't spell out, you don't tell the waiter who wants what. You don't, in other words, you don't tell him or her uh, whether it is that a boy wants the maza or the girl wants the maza, you don't spell it out. So just wait when the waiter brings over the beverages and see uh, normally in usual situations who gets what. Now you notice that in most occasions, it's the man or the male or the boy, whoever that is. Uh, he is a person who's likely to get the fizzy black drink. It could be thumbs up, it could be Coca Cola, it could be anything really. Whereas, again, very likely in most occasions, you'd find it's the woman, the female, the girl, the lady uh, who ends up getting this sweet, fruity drink. Now, the point is, and the point I'm trying to sort of hammer home over here is the fact that no one had explicitly told the waiter or the person who was uh, serving you who wants what. No one spelled it out to him or her. But it's something we've internalized. It's a set of expectations, a set of codes which we've internalized through our daily practices, rituals, which make us believe that men want certain things, men subscribe to certain things, 
and females subscribe to certain other things as well. So it's a neat binary. It's something which we uh, observe internalize as codes. So the word code is very, very important. It's almost urgent, imperative uh, in any study of gender, in any serious study of gender. So when you talk about code, what do I mean when I say the word code? So what I'm saying is essentially that the idea of masculinity, the idea of femininity is basically a construction and replication of certain codes of behavior. This could be codes of conduct, this could be codes of dressing, this could be codes of language, uh, these could be codes of embodiment, etc. So it's a very defined coded system and of course uh, that is how we you know, we, we talk, talk about the binary between man and woman, male and female, masculine and feminine, etc. Now, one of the things which we will do in this course is we will problematize this binary. We'll look at the constructed quality of this binary. So, in other words, we will look at gender or the division of gender or gendered identities not as natural givens, but as something which is artificially constructed only. It is so endlessly ritualized and internalized and replicated that a point comes, a time comes when we do not question the constructive quality of these gender definitions. We sort of accept it, we consume it unquestioningly. In other words, gender is a set of codes which we consume. It's something which we internalize. For instance, if uh, I am the waiter waiting in a restaurant and if a man and a woman come to my restaurant and randomly order a thumbs up and a maza, I will probably, in all likelihood, if no one tells me who wants what, I will probably end up doing the same thing as the waiter in a hypothetical example did, right? Now, it doesn't end there. Suppose, as I mentioned, suppose this is a posh restaurant. This is one of those places where they give you a feedback form these days. So, you sit at the end of the meal and the waiter comes over with, uh, with a bill, the check, uh, to be paid and a feedback form. Now, again, you notice, and this is probably more common, you notice that on most occasions, it's a man who gets the check and it's a woman who gets the feedback form. Now, what do you make of it? So, the implication is, the expectation is, it's a male who owns the financial capital. It's a ma male who owns the cash, in other words. And it's a female who owns the cultural capital, the language, the lyrical, lovely language, the metaphorical language, which, with which you can fill in a feedback form. You can say nice things or angry things. In other words, the woman possesses the cultural capital, whereas the male possesses the financial capital. Now again, when we talk about these things in these terms, it all sounds very crude. It all sounds very depressingly crude. But the point is, this is exactly what we internalize without questioning every single day. And one of the complexities of this course, as I keep mentioning, is to unpack these codes, to decode these divisions, to recognize the binaries, the constructed quality of these cultural codes. So you stop questioning, you know. You start questioning. You ask the waiter, why is it that you expected that the hard drink, the fizzy drink would go to the male and the soft mango sweet drink will go to the female? Why is it that you expected, you sort of assumed, you took for granted that some man who carries the wallet and has, has the cash to pay the end of the meal? As a woman who is more prone to you know, being the cultured person with which she can fill in a feedback form. So these are the, these are the very rigid, crude binaries which will keep questioning as we move on, as we proceed with this course. But of course, what we'll do is we will do a balancing act. We will take social situations, we will take theoretical situations, and then we will look at certain literary situations. So we'll take examples from literary novels, uh, poems, short stories, uh, we study a play and that is how we will keep decoding the gender division, the gender identities and the gender performances in literature as well as in real life. Now, let us start with the very basic definition. What is gender? What is the definition? What is the working definition of gender? Is gender the same as biological identity? Is masculinity the same as maleness? Is femininity the same as femaleness? Or are there any differences? Are there any nuanced differences between masculinity and maleness, biological maleness, femininity and biological femaleness? In other words, to what extent is gender biologically determined 
and to what extent is it culturally determined? Is there a cultural component to gender? Is it a cultural construct? Is it entirely a cultural construct? Or is it a balance between the two? Now, a good starting point would be to look at gender as an asymmetrical entanglement between biology and ideology. I'll say that again. It's an asymmetrical entanglement. It's not a 50-50 division. So we can't really say it's 50% biology and 50% ideology. We'll never determine the extent to which these combine. But it's an entanglement. And it's a very useful word in critical theory, literary theory. So if you're doing feminism, if you're doing uh, masculinity studies, if you're doing deconstruction, entanglement is the word which you keep returning to. It's a very handy word. It's a term borrowed from quantum physics. Now, so gender, in other words, is an asymmetrical entanglement between biology and ideology. It, it depends, of course, to a large extent on your biological location, but equally, it depends to a large extent on your cultural location, on your linguistic location, on your racial location, on your political location. So all these things combine together to produce, reproduce, construct, reconstruct gendered identities. Now, uh, one of the critics that we will keep looking at on this course is someone called Judith Butler. Now, Butler is famous for many things and uh, you know, she keeps producing phenomenal work. But for the purpose of this course, we will limit our look at Butler in terms of what she says about gender. Now, she has this seminal work in gender studies called Gender Trouble. Right? It's one of those texts which is basically like a textbook for gender. It's something which you keep returning to as students, researchers, teachers. So, among the many things she does in Gender Trouble, among the many things Butler proposes in Gender Trouble, uh, some of the things which stand out is the idea of gender as a verb. So, if you are to give a part of speech to gender, would it be a noun? Would it be an adjective? Would it be a pronoun? What would it be? Now, Butler proposes, we call gender, we define gender as a verb, as an act of happening, as a process, as a process of production. So, gender is a process of production. Equally, it's a process of reproduction. It's a process of construction. Equally, it's a process of deconstruction and reconstruction. Now, one of the things which Butler talks about extensively in Gender Trouble and one which we will return to over and over again as we proceed through this course is her idea of performativity. So what is performativity? Now performativity according to Butler is a, a kind of performance which is used to produce an effect. A-F-F-E-C-T. It produces an effect. Now that effect can be an effect of awe, wonder, it could be an effect of heroism. So you, you basically you watch a performative act, right? And you're awed by the spectacular quality of the act. Now, gender, according to Butler, depends a lot on performativity, especially as gender plays out in the public space. So, what is masculine in a public space? What is feminine in a public space? Largely depends on the politics of performativity. So, performativity is performance which is political. Performance which is used and designed to generate an effect, A-F-F-E-C-T. So not only is it effective, it is also equally effective. It affects you emotionally, sentimentally. It produces the structure of sentiments. So for instance, if you watch uh, a film, where a certain kind of masculinity, a certain kind of gender performance is spectacularly played out. Now, it is intended by the filmmaker, by the producer, whoever, or the actor, that you are moved in a certain direction emotionally, that you either you are moved with awe, respect, wonder, reverence, fear, or a combination of all these things. So, you watch a larger than life hero, uh, you know, play out a spectacularly masculine scene. The intended effect is to move you emotionally. So, a large part of gender studies, according to me, uh, and you know, this is something which will keep returning in this course, is dependent on space. 
where is this particular gender identity being played out? Is it being played out in a public place? Is it, played out, is it being played out in a private space? Is it being played out in a semi-public space, an urban space, a suburban space, a peri-urban space? So the definitions of gender, the definitions of masculinity, femininity, these keep changing depending on the spatial location. Say for instance, if you're talking about a spectacularly public space, say the parliament of a country, there's a certain kind of gendered code in that kind of a space. Right? You're expected to behave in a particular way. You're expected to dress in a particular way. You're expected to talk in a particular way. And the same kind of gender politics will not be operated inside a drawing room, inside a domestic space, inside someone's home, which is more intimate, where you know, this, the entire division of gender will be different. Now, of course, uh, as I just mentioned, space and gendered identities are very complex and related. And so is language and gendered identities. Language is notoriously gendered. We don't realize it all the time. We consume that kind of gendered language all the time. We use it. We articulate it. But rarely, if ever at all, do we question the gendered, constructed quality of language. So think of a verb like man up, which is you know, randomly used in sports rhetoric, military rhetoric, you know, the kind of space where masculinity uh, is given a high premium. So people are told to man up. People are said, told to you know, brace up, become brave. Now notice uh, the preposition over here, up. It's going upwards. So the implication is, if you're manly, if you're masculinizing yourself, you're moving upward. It's an act of elevation, elevated embodiment, something to do to make yourself better as a person, as a character. Now, obviously, there are numerous other examples that you can think of, and we'll talk about, as we move on, we'll talk about the relationship between literature, uh, between literary language and gender in more details as we choose certain texts. Now, to talk about gender as something which is happening every single day, we talk about gender as something that is a process that produces identities every single day, is also to notice that these modes of production are culturally and materially mediated. So in other words, uh, how is a male supposed to look like in a particular culture? How is a female supposed to look like in a particular culture? Now, these are not abstract phenomena. These are very, very notoriously material phenomena. It depends on the market. It depends on the culture of commodities. It depends on the economy. So all these things are enmeshed in any study of gender. So you would notice, uh, in, you know, very close to home, if you look at the Indian economy, if you look at the Indian idea of gender at the moment, a very good index of the changing notions of gender, the changing notions of masculinity and femininity is to look at popular cinema. That could be Bollywood, it could be any regional cinema that you could look at. As how certain codes of masculinity and femininity change over time, right? How a certain kind of dominant masculinity gets out of fashion and a new kind of dominant masculinity becomes fashionable. Now all these things are tied complexly connected complexly to economic conditions. Say, think for once, the different varieties of masculine creams which are available in the market today. You know, fair and handsome, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, fairness creams for men, you know, face washes for men which are supposed to make you fair and handsome and good looking. You know, all these things together, I mean, these were unheard of, say, in the 80s. In the 80s and the 70s, if you look at the Indian market, uh, there were hardly any reference, any presence of any fairness creams or lotions or face washes for men. The entire cosmetic category was feminine. So if you walked into a big departmental store, uh, if you're looking for fairness creams, you'd be getting uh, you know, fair and lovely creams. But again, look at the change in adjectives. Lovely, as against handsome. Now, 
it's perfectly logically true, grammatically correct to call a woman handsome, right? Because handsome, objectively speaking, handsome doesn't have any objective, any, any gendered underpinning to it. But we all know it does. So if you were to go up to a woman and call her handsome, I don't think the person would be particularly flattered. But if we say that to a man, a boy, that would work. So again, look at the way how adjectives are gendered. Notoriously gendered, right? Now, if we are to use the word lovely, right, or beautiful, but these would be perfectly applicable to women. And hence, when these sort of play out in a commodity culture, when you talk about commodity, uh, you know, in terms of creams, in terms of cosmetic commodities, in terms of fairness creams, so these adjectives play out in the different binaristic systems. They're sort of classified. So we talk about male creams, uh, the word handsome appears there. We talk about female creams, the word lovely appears there. And it's very important that people don't mix up the two. So again, we find that even in something as uh, quote-unquote unideological as a departmental store, and of course, we all know, those of us uh, who study a little bit of critical theory would know, uh, the departmental store is possibly the most ideological of all spaces. You know, I mean, you just have to take a look at how uh, commodities are classified. You know? So you have this cosmetic section at a certain corner, we have the kitchen section at a certain corner, we have the gardening section at a certain corner, you have the pet section at a certain corner, you know, uh, even in terms of consumables, uh, the different kinds of biscuits, the different kinds of cakes, and all these are deeply gendered, all these are deeply discursive, you know, these are nothing uh, if not discursive. So nothing in a departmental store is unideological, right? And one of the things that I would hopefully be able to impress upon you at the end of the course, by the end of the course, is when you walk into a social situation, when you walk into a real situation, right? Not, not, not just in a literary novel, not just a, a literary poem or a drama, but in a real social space. When you walk into such a space, you find that much of that is deeply coded with gendered identities, underpinnings, and expectations. And one of the things which we will do in this course is to decode those underpinnings. Find out why, how, how is it? And why is it that fair and handsome frames came and became fashionable, which were not there 20 years ago, 30 years ago? What happened? Now, if you look at the Indian economic system, if you look at the Indian mercantile system, an economy is a big part of gender studies. We all know that. You know, as I mentioned, when I gave you the crude example of a restaurant, you know, the expectation is it's a male who controls the capital, you know, and it's a woman who has better access to culture, right? These, these are, you know, crude divisions we make all the time. Now, with the advent of the liberal economy in India, when the economy was liberalized in the mid-90s, the Indian market was suddenly opened to a, a variety, a, a rich range of products from different countries. Now, there is only a point to which we can have consumers for cosmetic creams. You know, you can just address it to the woman and they will buy it. But what if you want to expand the clientele? What if you want to uh, expand the base of your consumers? What if you incorporate the men, the males? What if you convince them that, uh, you know, it's very, very desirable to be fair, it's very desirable to be handsome, it's desirable to look good? And once you circulate that kind of a rhetoric, once you circulate that kind of a discourse through movies, uh, through plays, through advertisements, through songs, different kinds of cultural quotes, once you do that, the next thing you ought to do is you ought to introduce the right kind of commodities. You ought to introduce the right kind of creams, the right kind of cosmetic products for men to consume. So suddenly, you know, it became okay for men to consume fairness creams. It became okay for men to be anxious about looking good. And this is also the time in India, and we look at the Indian context in the schools particularly, but also other cultural contexts, but at the moment we're looking at the Indian context. This is also the time when the idea of the metrosexual man began to emerge. Now, who is the metrosexual man? We heard the term many times in show, here on all kinds of occasions. The metrosexual man is someone who is very anxious about looking good. There's someone who is single, sometimes, uh, a working man with a white-collar job, 
a very urban man, a very urban identity. So metrosexuality, metrosexual maleness, is a very urban kind of gendered code. Now obviously it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the urban metrosexual man would be quite interested in looking fair and looking good and looking handsome. In other words, to sort of borrow a little bit from the fair and handsome category, but of course, uh, sorry, fair and lovely category, but of course, you know, if you say a man looks lovely, it's probably pushing it. So the easy, the safe thing to do is to make him look handsome first and then lovely later. So the process begins in the mid 90s when the Indian market begins to be filled with these kind of creams, cosmetics, soaps, face washes, shampoos, all aiming to produce beautiful men, handsome men, right? Men who are anxious about the looks, good looks. So what we see immediately is a certain kind of value system being constructed, a certain kind of expectation being constructed true commodities, true markers like creams, lotions, body wash, shampoos, face washes, etc. So, in other words, gender is a term which is notoriously slippery. It's a verb, it's a process, it's always happening. It's happening even as we speak, you and I speak. The way I'm addressing you, the way you're receiving my address is deeply gendered. The way I'm sitting, the way I'm dressing up for this occasion is deeply gendered. Because I'm aware of the fact that I'm here to teach you a course. I'm here as an instructor, a course instructor. So I'm performing the role of a course instructor. This is deeply performative. So all these things have been played and internalized and ritualized all the time. Now, one can go back a long time to unpack how this division of gender happened in history. How is it that uh, men uh, became the possessors of rationality? and women uh, were considered to be hysterics, emotional, sentimental. So, you know, if you talk about a man being sentimental, a man being emotional, it's not necessarily a positive thing, although it's increasingly becoming acceptable. But suppose you go back and find a strong and silent type of man, the stereotypical, burly, action hero kind of a man, who doesn't talk much, he's not emotional, you know, hardly exhibits any sentiment or emotion, but gets the work done. Rational, clinical, logical. So all these abstract phenomena like rationality, logic, knowledge, these are deeply, deeply gendered, as are emotions, sentiments, identities. So we talk about emotions being something abstract. We talk about rationality, knowledge, logic being abstract categories, but they're not. These are deeply materially mediated categories. And of course, these are deeply gendered categories. Now, those of us who are interested in the philosophy of knowledge, those of us who are interested in how knowledge through different historical processes was produced, reproduced, configured, reconfigured through time, we we'll go back to what we now consider to be the European Enlightenment. Now, the European Enlightenment, the, the phenomenon which roughly happened around the, sort of the 16th century, where the big philosophers uh, of reason, logic, rationality uh, were writing their theses in, in Europe. Uh, we talk about Immanuel Kant, we talk about Hegel, uh, you know, the different kinds of people, Schegel, you know. So, all these German philosophers, the English philosophers, uh, who was sort of basically contributing to what we now call the Enlightenment had something in common, right? As did someone called René Descartes. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of René Descartes. We talk about Descartes being one of the finest proponents of logic, thinking, free thinking. So he has this uh, magnificent and uh, you know oft quoted saying, "I think, therefore I am." Right? And he's someone who's credited uh, as being one of the first philosophers of humanism. So he talks about the primacy of the human being in this planet. So human being as a possessor of knowledge, as someone who controls knowledge, as someone who can produce knowledge, as someone who can navigate with knowledge through a process of thinking, the cogito of Dekra, the conscious self, the brain, the mind. Now all these sound lovely, 
doesn't it? That you know, who wouldn't want to control knowledge? Who wouldn't want to know that you know, uh, what I am is basically dependent on what I'm thinking or how I'm thinking. In other words, I have a lot of choice. What I am is determined by how I process my thoughts, how I interact with reason, how I navigate with knowledge. These are the categories, these are the processes which make me who I am. It's lovely. Who wouldn't want it? But there's a problem here. Now what Dekra was also saying, and I, I will not go too deep into the philosophy of Dekra, but suffice it to say, what Dekra was also doing for this process is he was making a division of the mind and the body. So whereas the mind is the abode of rationality, the temple of reason, the landscape of logic is where you know, the logical, rational, you know, controlled self inhabits. The body for Dekra becomes passive, anarchic, hysteric, animalistic. Now the moment this division happened, the moment this binary took place, the, the automatic next step was to gender it. So when you talk about the rational self, the logical mind, the thinking mind, the thinking, rational, logical mind and self was immediately masculinized. It was male. Whereas the anarchic, hysteric, emotional body is female. But this is the beginning. This is one of the many ways in which gender divisions were introduced in knowledge, were introduced in discourses, uh, and introduced in popular culture, and introduced in what we consume as knowledge, etc. But this is a very important point in the history of human knowledge, where the mind was masculinized and the body was feminized. So, men came to be considered as this logical, rational beings who could control knowledge, uh, conquer empires, establish empires, uh, control capital, control cash, control commodity, whereas the woman, the female, would be the people with emotions, people with uh, you know, sentiments, which could be spelt out in beautiful language. And now think of the hypothetical example I gave you. We come a long way from Dekra when I talked about the waiter in a restaurant. Now, he hadn't read Dekra. I'm sure he hadn't. You know. uh, in all likelihood, he hadn't. But he had consumed this kind of logical binary. He had consumed this kind of discursive binary that had traveled through time, through cultures. Dekra was a French philosopher of enlightenment. Now we're talking about someone in India, current day India who keeps consuming, who continues to consume these kind of binaries of the logical, calculative, capitalist male <clears throat> and the emotional, metaphorical, lyrical female. Now, this binary is something which affects all of us. Now, oftentimes we don't question it because we're very happy consumers of it. Uh, there are privileges if we consume these gendered binaries. For instance, as a man, you know, you're privileged because you automatically thought, you automatically considered to be certain things, right? As a female, likewise, uh, you're privileged because you automatically expected to be certain things. But what if you begin to question? What if your real life situation becomes such? There's easy assumptions. These consumptions become questionable, become problematic. What if you start to think that, hang on a second, uh, this expectation out of me is an artificial expectation. It's got nothing to do with what I want. It's got nothing to do with what I really am. It's kind of code which is expected of me. It's expected that I internalize that code. It's expected that I carry on, carry out this code. I execute it, embody it, enact it, extend it ad infinitum. But what if you want to question it? What if you want to interrupt it? And we'll talk about interruption as a philosophical category in this course. What is interruption? What are interrupted identities? What are the identities of gender which rely on self-questioning? Right? Something which you, know, you ask yourself, am I supposed to do this as a male, as a female? Now mind you, there are deeper divisions. There are other factors which come in. And one of the immediate factors which come into any study of gender is race. Your racial location. 
whether you're white, non-white, Caucasian, Mongoloid, Asian. Now, of course, alongside race, you have other factors which come in, nationality, political identity. So, for instance, if you are a white, wealthy, first world American person, say, white, wealthy American male, you're the closest and come to God in terms of the gender map. You are essentially uh, the gendered God because you're privileged racially, financially, culturally, politically, etc. And of course, biologically. But what if you are a non-wealthy white person who is living somewhere elsewhere? Then it's more complex because you have the race on your side, right? You have the biological identity on your side. But you, your entire gendered identity, which is an entire embodiment, which relies on language, capital, cash, culture, these things become problematized. So your gendered identity, in other words, is deeply dependent on your political, economic, racial, linguistic identities. These are equally important. Now, one of the things which we will do in this course is to look at the relationship between imperialism and gender. So, what was the kind, what was the brand of gendered identities which was produced during British imperialism in India? I will, I will look at the Indo-British context because that's something which we can relate to as Indians today, looking back at that. So, what was the kind of identity which became the hegemonic, the dominant gendered identity? And equally, what was the non-dominant gendered identity? Now, mind you, I'm not just talking about gender identities, biological identities, right? So, uh, you must have heard the stereotype, you know, any, anyone who has done any kind of study on British and Anglo-Indian gendered identities would know that one of the gendered stereotypes which was promoted during the empire was the effeminate Bengali Babu. Someone is fat, inefficient, uh, inadequately masculine, effeminate, etc. Now, as a, as a Bengali male myself in 2017, I find that stereotype very, very interesting and amusing. But there's a reason why that stereotype was constructed. There's a reason why that was produced and circulated and consumed, not just by the British, but also by the Indians, by the Bengalis. And the reason is imperialism in order to succeed, needed to produce this unique identities of power, dominance, and equally, it needed to produce its others, the other identity, the other man. So the Bengali Babu, as a cultural construct, as a discursive construct, became a very convenient other for the manly Englishman. Mind you, both the Bengali Babu and the Englishman are biologically male. They are anatomically, biologically the same kind of system. But then why is it that in a, in, a, in a scale of gender, one is masculine and the other is non-masculine, effeminate? And this is where culture, language, political scope, political agency, political situations, race come in handy. When you have to study this division, when you have to study these gaps between genders, gender identities, racial identities, these divisions become very, very important. And we'll talk about the Bengali Babu and the British uh, military man in more details as we proceed with this course. Now, the other point that I want to talk about a little bit in this introduction today is the relationship between gender. I mean, I just I touched upon it a little bit already, but I still reiterated gender and value system. Now, value system, of course, works best when we realize that you know it's not really you know when we realize when we don't realize it's a construct. Value system works best when we accept it, when we consume it as a given, as something which is you know already there, already always there. The problem begins when we begin to question it, when we begin to say, oh, hang on, why is the value system this way? 
why is it that there are certain kinds of expectations for men and certain other kinds of expectations for women in the same culture? And why is it that these expectations vary from culture to culture? Why is it that they are notoriously culture sensitive, context sensitive? The reason is not far to seek. The reason is value systems are as material as abstract. These are produced due to certain real, material, historical, social, scientific situations. And as a result, you know, we, we have this value system which becomes a grand narrative for certain kinds of conduct, certain kinds of conduct for good men, for good women, for bad men, for bad women. So these grand narratives are produced politically, of course, there is nothing all political. So one of the things which we realize uh, immediately in gender studies that there is no such thing as a political or an ideological situation. The moment you say you are political, that itself becomes a political stand. The moment you say this is an unideological space, that itself becomes deeply ideological. So gender is a political phenomenon, gender is a social phenomenon, gender is an ideological phenomenon. It depends on lots of external factors. There is a biological component to it, but that's not everything. That's not everything we need to know about gender. Gender is more complex than biology. So we, you know, we'll talk about feminism quite a bit in this course, and the next lecture would be on the history of feminism uh, and the history of masculinity in, in to a certain extent. So this very famous quotation by the French feminist Simone de Beauvoir, who mentioned fantastically, I think, that one is not born, one becomes a woman. See, in, in other words, you're not, it's not as if you're born and you become a woman by default. The process of becoming a woman is a complex material process. It moves through language, it moves through political situations, it moves through racial situations. So it's a constant process and this is sort of in connection to what Butler said much later, you know, a century and a half later, where she said that you know, gender is a verb, you know, gender is a process of happening, it's a process of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. In other words, what Bivua meant when he, she said that one is not born, one becomes a woman is there is a certain code which has been produced culturally, politically, materially, economically. And the whole agenda of becoming a woman is to conform to that code through your life, through your language, through your value system, through your activities. So if you conform to that code, you essentially become the woman. The woman is a code out there. It's like a crypt. And you know, your job as a female uh, is to conform, is, is to enact a series of processes, a series of activities to which you begin to conform to the court. And the moment you conform to the court, you become neatly a woman. Equally, the moment you conform to the courts of manly behavior, you become neatly a male, a man. Funny thing is, of course, as I mentioned already, that these courts change all the time. So what is manly behavior today in, say, for instance, uh, United States of America would not be manly behavior 50 years later in Beijing. Now, I'll just give you an example. In ancient Sparta, it was considered to be part of the value system, the hegemonic value system, that whenever uh, a male infant was born, whenever there was the birth of a male infant, that infant would be taken to the top of a hill, put on a stone, and covered with a fig leaf for the duration of a whole night. So the infant would be taken to the hill, put on a stone, a cold stone, and a fig leaf will be put on him, you know, and it will be left like this for one night. The next day, the Spartans would go up to the hill, and if the infant survived the cold, survived the hill, then he would be raised as a Spartan, a Spartan male. Because you know, every Spartan male had to be a warrior, had to be a soldier. Because if you look at Athens and Sparta in ancient Greece, Sparta was the military masculine component of the Greek civilization, whereas Athens was the cultural, artistic component of Greek civilization. So even there, the gender division is quite obvious. 
Now, to come back to the example I just gave, if someone were to do it today in India, this would be considered barbaric, unacceptable, and of course, uh, something which is completely uh, redundant. I mean, you know, what, what purpose does it serve? Now, obviously, it did serve a massive purpose in ancient Sparta. Because the point was, unequivocally, the point was that virtually every Spartan man should be good enough to be a soldier. So either you're a hegemonic warrior male or you're nothing or you don't exist. There's no other division you know, inside the masculine map in Sparta. It had to be one kind of masculinity, whereas military masculinity. There can be no other way around. There can be no other kind of masculinity which is permissible in that kind of culture. So this is one example and I'm sure you can think of many other examples in which expectations, value systems, these are materially produced. Now, of course, uh, the material production, the material condition of this process is the civilization of Sparta, which is a warrior civilization, a military civilization, where they were facing invasions from you know, different parts of the world. So they should also always be prepared to face the invasions and they should be prepared. So the citizens should also double up as an army. The male citizens should also double up as an army. So that was the material condition which produced this kind of value system in ancient Sparta, right? And hence we have this value system which is abstract. But as you can just see, uh, this example exhibited hopefully that this value system was produced out of certain real political material conditions. And I you know you can think of many examples closer to home. You can think of many examples uh, in Nazi Germany, uh, in Imperial Britain, you know, where this kind of gender division was promoted and was celebrated, glorified, you know, in a, in a massive kind of a way. <clears throat> so, the relationship between value and gender is quite complex. The relationship between language and gender is quite complex because, you know, as you know, any study of feminism would reveal to us, that language, especially the language of knowledge, or the language that matters really, is deeply patriarchal. It's something which is uh, embedded in patriarchy, right? It's sort of full of these codes of patriarchy. So I just gave you one flashy example of manning up as a, you know, emotionally elevating yourself, and you know how that act of elevation is male because it's a good thing. You know, so men man up, men brace up, etc. The converse of this is to, you know, assume females break down. So breaking down, becoming hysterics. Uh, or becoming hysteric, uh, or hysteria itself is a very female disease, right? It's something which happens only to women. And we, when we talk about that, we'll see how hysteria is reconfigured uh, and becomes a male disease as well, after a certain political event. We'll talk about that later as we take up a course. We will take up, you know, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. We look at this, how uh, medicine and masculinity are you know, deeply related, right? And that is another topic that we will cover in this course. The relationship between medical knowledge and gender, right? If there's any kind of knowledge, whether it's medical knowledge, political knowledge, uh, cultural knowledge, um, knowledge itself is deeply gendered. The language of knowledge is patriarchal. The language of knowledge is embedded in patriarchy. And one of the things I will urge you to do, I will insist that you do, is to look out for the ways in which patriarchy is sort of smuggled in the language of knowledge. It doesn't manifest itself clearly sometimes, right? It's sometimes more surreptitious, sometimes more hidden, more latent. And it is our job as students of gender, as teachers of gender studies, as teachers of critical theory for the matter, to look at this embedded surreptitious quality of patriarchy in language, especially when it comes to a language of power the language of knowledge. Now, of course, power and knowledge, these are deeply gendered things. And you know, it, does, it, it don't require me to tell you, I'm sure, that how power and knowledge are related. So whoever has knowledge possesses power. So obviously, it's a big deal. It is a very important thing uh, that who controls the language of power, the language of knowledge. Now, as you know, uh, and this is where religion comes in, interestingly, uh, in gender studies. As you know, in medieval times, whether it's medieval Europe or medieval India uh, or anywhere in the world for the matter, uh, you would find that this was a time when 
religion and knowledge were deeply and intricately related to each other, right? So religion informed knowledge, knowledge informed religion, etc. So religion determined what kind of knowledge was permissible, religion determined what kind of knowledge was banned, etc. So during this medieval times where science had not come up in a big way, so knowledge was still largely controlled and determined by religion and the clergy, you would find in virtually every culture that we know of, the language of knowledge and the language of religion was deeply male and it belonged to the males. It's like, you know, the first line of the New Testament. In the beginning there was a word and the word was God and the word belonged to God. Now, of course, this is metaphorical, but if we can sort of tease out uh, the metaphoricity out of it, it's something which plays out and holds true of, uh, for virtually every kind of political knowledge based system. In the beginning, there was a knowledge and the knowledge belonged to men. And more importantly, the language of knowledge, the medium of knowledge was deeply masculine. The woman didn't have access to it. The woman had no access to power. And you know, you can think of uh, all the examples of women in Europe. Uh, you know, you don't have to go very far back. So even as late as 14th and 15th centuries, we have examples of witch burning. And even more recently, you have examples of witch burning in you know, mainland Europe. I mean, we're not talking about some obscure corner of European civilization. We talk about France, England, Germany. Numerous instances of witch hunting, witch burning. Uh, burning down the woman because they are becoming a problem. They are questioning uh, the idea of knowledge, they are questioning the ontology of knowledge, they are questioning who controls knowledge. So these are things which have been questioned by the woman. So obviously the, the very important, the, 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 the obvious thing to do is to burn them down, is to kill them, is to exterminate any possibility of deconstruction. And this is how historically patriarchy has worked as a self-preservation system, as a self-perpetuating system. Right? It produces knowledge and then it protects it. It protects it against any kind of invasion, any kind of other invasion from the other. The other can be a woman, the other can be an other race, the other can be a black man, the other can be anything. Right? So, patriarchy had produced and perpetuated knowledge. It's a knowledge from its very inception as a deeply gendered category, a deeply gendered phenomenon. It's not innocent at all. Any kind of knowledge, legal knowledge, medical knowledge, even literary knowledge for the matter, right? These are deeply political things. Who possesses knowledge? That makes a big difference. Who controls knowledge? That makes a big difference. It's like who controls cash? It's like saying who controls the wallet? Who has the wallet? Who has a purse? That person has what we call agency in gender studies. Now, what is agency? So, we, for the remaining bit of this lecture, I will talk a little bit about agency and then I will move on to another topic. Now, agency, very briefly and bluntly put, is the ability to express your free self with the possibility of making a change. I will say that again. Agency is the ability to express your free self with the possibility of bringing about a change. Now, you may or may not be able to bring about the change in the end, but there is a possibility and you have that, you, know, you have that system, you have that network whereby you can express your free self as a human being, as a free thinking human being. Now, obviously, it is very complicated, it is very complex, it is a very loaded term as you may have guessed already. Now, we can talk about agency. Uh, or the lack of agency in extreme political situations, like for instance during apartheid in, in Africa, where you know the non-whites had virtually no agency, or you know uh, until the 19th century in, in in Europe, where the women had virtually no agency at all. They could not vote. They could not uh, possess any property. They had no inheritance rules which sort of supported them. So they're deeply dependent on the husbands, the fathers, the sons for the rocky and you know those of you who have read Jane Austen would know what I am talking about. Uh, you know the question in Jane Austen is why uh, for instance the most emblematic work of Jane Austen Pride and Prejudice, why 
Do you think Mrs. Bennett is so anxious to marry off her daughters? And it's very easy for us today uh, to judge her and say, oh, she is this hyperactive, uh, you know, funny, comical woman who is just making a fool of herself. But mind you, this is a cultural condition where the only available options for women, if they're not married, are either you are a, a governess, a seamstress, you work in a tailor shop somewhere, or you're a prostitute. So as a mother uh, of you know, several daughters, uh, it is perfectly valid, it's a very valid concern that a mother would be anxious when marrying all the daughters. Because you know, marriage becomes the most important, the most convenient way for a woman to have a good life. So it's a tragedy, right? I mean, many people read Pride and Prejudice, I know, as a romantic comedy, but it's not a romantic comedy. Uh, I insist that you go back to the novel and reread it. You'll find that it's a deeply gendered text where the men control the capital, the men control the property, and the women are just made to look pretty. All the women have to do is look pretty and make themselves attractive before men. Now, it's not a, it's, it's a very depressing situation when you think about it in more detail. So your entire idea of being a woman uh, is to appear attractive so that you buy, you find a, you find a buyer, essentially, as someone who buys you uh, in the marriage market and then your life is settled. And that's not a happy proposition. That's not a happy scenario at all. Uh, that's what happens in Pride and Prejudice to a great extent, right? So it's a deeply gendered text. Now, coming back to agency. So, you know, in Pride and Prejudice, agency plays out, is sort of dramatized, you know, across the novel through different characters, different situations. Now, agency, <clears throat> my favorite example of agency, uh, or how agency is denied to you, not just explicitly sometimes, but also implicitly, right? Sometimes we don't realize we don't have agency. Uh, sometimes we think we have agency, but actually we don't, right? Uh, we think we are free. We think we are uh, free by the dint of a gendered identities, by a gendered location, etc., etc. but actually we are not. And my favorite example of this is an example given by uh, the philosopher Slavoj Žižek in a book called uh, Welcome to the Desert of the Real, which is a series of essays uh, on post 9 11 uh, Western world. Now, in that essay, in that book of essays, Zizek gives a very interesting example. He talks about East Germany, communist East Germany, you know, before the Berlin Wall fell. And in that kind of a social situation, that kind of a cultural context, whoever who was suspected of treason, of any anti state activity, would be arrested and sent to a concentration camp. So, in other words, there'd be no trial. This is like uh, a complete fascist system where if you're suspected of doing something, you, you don't really even have a chance to appear in a trial. So you're sent off, you're packed off to a concentration camp uh, indefinitely. So it's a very bad state to be in, a rotten state. And in that kind of situation, uh, a man gets arrested because you know, certain uh, objectionable letters are found uh, in his possession. And he, of course, uh, is not even given a chance to appear in a trial. He's told that he'll be sent off to a concentration camp uh, indefinitely. Before he leaves for the concentration camp, he, uh, he has a deal with his friends. He sits down with his friends uh, the day before his departure and tells them, well, listen, I will be in the concentration camp, uh, but I need to write letters to you. And of course, because I'm in a concentration camp, uh, they will be intercepting all the letters. They'll be reading all the letters before they come to you. So let us establish a code. Let us establish a certain kind of cryptic communication, which only we are aware of. And what is the code they establish? So the guy said to his friends, that if I write a letter to you in blue ink, assume everything I'm saying or writing is true. Right? But if I'm writing the letter to you in red ink, just invert the meaning. So for instance, if I were to tell you, I am very well, I am very healthy, happy and well. If that's written in blue ink, just assume that I really am happy, happy, healthy, and well. But if that appears to you, if that comes to you written in red ink, assume that maybe I'm in deep trouble. I'm about to die, perhaps. But I can't say it, of course, because you know they will not let me write that stuff to you. So if that is in red ink, then invert the logic completely. So have you made this arrangement? Have you made this deal with his friends? He goes away. Uh, to the concentration camp. A month later, his friends receive a letter from him, written in blue ink, telling them that he is very well, 
that you know I am very well. Uh, I seem to be having a very good time over here. I find myself enjoying my life in this concentration camp. I don't know why people complain about the concentration camp so much. You, you get free movies on weekends. You get you know ample butter and honey. Uh, you get, in other words, you get everything you need to live a good life, except one thing. You don't get red ink. Now, those of you who got the joke would know that what he actually means in that kind of a communication is this. You get everything you need to be happy, all the material things, except that one thing which will allow you to tell people how you really are. You don't get the metaphorical red ink, which will let you speak your mind, which will let you express yourself in a way which is free, unchained. So his friends would never get to know what he really means. And this is my very, it's one of my favorite examples of agency, the lack of agency, not just in an extreme, explicit situation where you know there will be no agency at all, but in a more surreptitious situation where it's sort of apparently and superficially there, but actually not being there. Gender has a lot to do with agency. Masculinity, femininity, what you are as a biological man, as a biological woman, has got a lot to do with agency. To what extent are you allowed to express yourself? To what extent are you allowed to be your true self? Or are you actually consumed by the expectations around you? Or are you a consumer yourself of the expectations around you? So in consuming the expectations, you too are consumed. You become a part of the expectation economy, right? So you know, you, you find it completely unable, uh, you find it impossible to step out of it and question it. But you know, you keep consuming it unquestioningly. And we will, uh, in, in the course of this essay, in this course of this course, sorry, uh, forgive the pun, uh, there will be one essay which we will study. It's called Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell. Where I, I would look at how uh, the gender identity in that particular essay, which in this case is uh, Imperial British masculinity, how the gender identity of power, privilege, actually becomes powerlessness. It sort of turns inside out, it flips out in a way. And it becomes an example of powerlessness, agencylessness. How privilege becomes poverty, right? And how gender becomes a prison house. How, you know, instead of something which liberates you, it imprisons you, right? Now, it's very easy to see how uh, you can be imprisoned by your uh, insufficient gender identity. So, for instance, if you are a uh, black man uh, in colonial Africa, or if you are a black woman in colonial Africa, you are doubly marginalized. A, because of your racial location, and B, because of your biological location. Right? And that is something which is easy to unpack. So, if you are a black man in Africa, colonial Africa, if you are a black woman in colonial Africa, you know, it is expected that you will suffer from a lack of agency. Because that's what the political situation is. It's a situation of exploitation, torture, uh, you know, opportunism, uh, a very, very unequal kind of exploitation. And exploitation obviously is unequal all the time, but it's something which is rampant. It's there on the surface. It's explicit. It's not even an attempt to disguise it as something else. But what if you're a white man in a colonial setting, right? Then theoretically or notionally, you occupy a position of privilege, right? Because you're a white man in a non-white space, in a colonial condition, where it's uh, you know, unequal and you're supposed to be powerful, you are powerful, etc. So you, you, in other words, you possess or you inhabit uh, you know, a privileged gendered identity, theoretically. And I use the word theoretically uh, with caution away. That's the operative word in this particular sentence. But what if? that particular privilege turns inside out and reveals to you, ironically, spectacularly, that what you consider privilege is basically a construct which is consuming you, right? All bait as a powerful person. So you're being consumed. Yes, you're a powerful person, but your powerfulness, your masculine, white, 
imperial powerfulness in its non-imperial space, in its colonial space, is basically uh, a construct which is consumed, right? So you, in other words, is a construct, are a construct. You know, you're not naturally powerful. You're not innately powerful. You're someone uh, who belongs to the construct of privilege. You're someone who belongs in this construct of power. And when you start to question it, then you realize what a puppet you are. You're not a puppet because you are a powerless slave in an apartheid Africa. That's out there on the surface. Everyone can see it. It's brutal, barbaric, but you know, it's easy to decode it. But this is more complex. You are powerless precisely because you are a powerful white man in a colonial setting. And when you read the essay, which we will uh, in due course of time, you'll realize how gender or gender identities or the, you know, the, the politics of production of gender identities is deeply complex in the sense that it sometimes liberates you, like I said, it, it gives you entitlement, it gives you privilege, uh, it allows you certain privileges, etc. But equally, the same privilege can come back to haunt you, can come back to consume you as a lack, as something that you suffer from. Right? So, just to conclude this opening lecture, and I hope I was able to uh, you know, communicate some of the core points, some of the core content that we will carry on discussing in more details in the schools. Gender and literature, or gender is something that we do, right? It's not something that we are sort of born with. You're born with a biological body. Every one of us is born with a biological body. But gender is something which we do with the body, right? Gender is something which we perform, right? Through our language, through our dress, through our rituals, through our religion, through our political privileges, through our racial locations, etc. It's a deeply material process. It's a deeply ideological process. It's a performative process. It performs, it constructs certain categories of power. Equally, it constructs certain categories of powerlessness. In other words, gender is an act of construction. If you push it further, gender is a text. Right? What is a text? So we are interested in this particular course in looking at the textuality of gender. So what is a text? A text is something, anything literally, which can be constructed. Right? Constructed ideologically, discursively, materially. And anything which can be studied as a construct is a text. So for instance, if I were to pick up this bottle in front of you, right? And if I were to just drink water out of it and then throw it away, I don't treat it as a text. But if I were to look at what is inside, you know, the laboratory in which it was produced, the location of the laboratory in which the filtration took place, uh, the date of the filtration process, the kind of social situation in which the laboratory is situated, then what I am doing essentially is I am treating this bottle, this plastic bottle as a text. And of course, I can treat, one should treat plastic bottles as text. These are very, very political texts. We all know that plastic is a text, right? But to come back to our concern over here, the textuality of gender lies precisely in the fact that it is something which can be constructed, which has been constructed. And like all texts, like everything that can be constructed, gender can be deconstructed and reconstructed. And this is exactly what we will do in the course of this particular course as we move on with this course. And I welcome you again to this course and I hope you have a good time looking at some of the literary texts which we will do. And like I said, we will keep we are doing a balancing act. We will keep doing a balancing act in this particular course. We will do the theoretical component, we will bring in the theories of gender and we will look at certain cultural, real, practical components of how that particular kind of gender politics plays out in real situations. And of course, literature is a very important medium which is a buffer between the real and the unreal. So fiction is not unreal, you know, it is different from being unreal. So when I look at a novel, I am not treating that as an unreal work. It's something between real and unreal. And hence, you have the word fiction. Otherwise, we could have just said fantasy, right? Fiction is more complex than fantasy, right? So, literature will offer you the platform which will be the buffer between the real uh, configurations of gender and the unreal configurations of gender, the theoretical configurations of gender. So, this is what we do in this course, and I hope you have a good time uh, following this and we'll make it as interactive as possible. 
And thank you for your attention. And this concludes the first lecture of this course. Thank you for listening. Thank you.